Ah, there you are, my Royal History Geek friends. We are, in this little video, answering the question of what was Margaret Beaufort's relationship like with her second proper husband. If you read it, if you read, if you read it on Wikipedia or other similar books, it'll talk about him as her third husband, but her second real husband, Henry Stafford. We talked in the last clip about her relationship with Edmund Tudor, who died, left her a widow when she was just 13 years old. She works, and we think, we think to a large extent at her own initiative, she works incredibly quickly to secure a new marriage for herself. And she, with the help of her brother-in-law, Jasper Tudor, find Henry Stafford to be the best match that is out there. Now, to understand why Henry Stafford is such a great match for Margaret Beaufort and why she's such a great match for him, we have to understand a little bit more about the context of the times and the world that she was living in. They were not considered a great match for each other because they liked each other, because they had good chemistry, because they were attracted to each other. In fact, Margaret's still really young at this stage and she's 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 13, she's sort of 14, 15 by the time they actually get married. And Henry Stafford's in his 30s. So there's a big, there's a big age gap still. And that would have been very apparent to them, just as it's apparent to us um, as onlookers looking back at that today. So that's not the reason. It's nothing to do. They probably hadn't really met each other before. We don't know exactly, but they wouldn't really have known each other when they first became man and wife. However, Margaret is living in dangerous times. She's a widow at the age of 13. She's given birth to a son, Henry Tudor, the future Henry VII, who is the nephew of um, Henry VI, the king, the king, the Lancastrian king, Henry VI. And she, of course, herself, as a member of the House of Beaufort, is strongly aligned to the, Lan 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 the Lancastrian affinity. That's where her card is marked. Well, that's great, you might say. He's the king. That's a really good person to be in with. And that's true. But we're starting now to get to the very early phases of the Wars of the Roses, where there was a rival to the throne, the Duke of York, who's also a cousin of Margaret, but a slightly more distant cousin of Margaret's. And of course, he is also a cousin of King Henry VI. And he thinks he has a better claim to the throne. Now, this hasn't quite happened yet. He hasn't quite at this stage made that claim in Parliament saying he thinks he should, is the rightful King of England. But tensions are building and Margaret is very firmly in the Lancastrian camp. There's a weak king. She doesn't know what the future holds for her. More importantly, she doesn't know what the future holds for her son, the king's nephew. Henry Stafford is a younger son of the Duke of Buckingham. The Duke of Buckingham is a rich, wealthy landowner. He is powerful. Perhaps he is the only other landowner, the only other lord who has power that might come anywhere close to the Duke of York. He's also a good, committed Lancastrian. And if Margaret can align herself to that dynasty, she may afford her and her son a degree of protection. Great. So what's in it for Stafford? Well, as I said before, he's a younger son. So he's the youngest of a duke, so he's never going to go penniless, let's not get carried away. But he's not got much to his name. He'll get a little bit of money from his father, and indeed that's what happened. But the bulk of his father's fortune will always go to his heir and the line of his first son. So what Henry Stafford really wants is a woman with a bit of money. Margaret, of course, is exactly that woman. By the time of her widowhood, she's probably got a fortune of around £1,200 a year. It's staggering for a woman to have that kind of fortune. It'd be pretty good for any noble to have that kind of fortune. A baron would be very happy with that. And indeed, there were, there are, there were some earls and dukes with less. So if he's married to Margaret and therefore has a lifetime interest in her estates, he's going to be a wealthy man. Was that important to Henry Stafford? Well, it was important to just about every medieval man of the era. So I think we can safely assume that it was. That's why they're such a good match for each other. How they feel about each other, to an extent, we can only infer from the limited information that we have available. On the one hand, Margaret doesn't waste much time in marrying again after his death, but I think it would be a misnomer to dwell too much on that. The best evidence we have 
is that from the records of the time of their own personal household records it looks as if they were always in each other's company they travel together they tour their estates together and they're not doing much to try and avoid each other given their income it would have been perfectly possible to be estranged for probably large parts of the year in England at that time that wouldn't have been seen as strange obviously the fact that most couples did not marry for love meant that people weren't necessarily expecting couples to always get on like a house on fire we don't know whether their relationship was one of passion they certainly didn't have any children together that's probably because Margaret's body was damaged uh, in giving birth to her first son her only son Henry at such a young age uh, we don't know if it was a friendship really or it was based on affection that we can't know but the best evidence we have is they enjoyed each other's company and that Margaret probably felt safe happy and secure with Henry Stafford that was not an experience that she was uniquely to feel throughout the course of her life.